Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. Secure Talk is brought to you by Adequest, your cybersecurity and compliance partner. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're going to be talking with Bina Rama Murthy. She is a instructor or professor at the University of Buffalo. She has a PhD in electrical engineering, and she's also director of blockchain at Think Labs. Additionally, she is the author of the book Blockchain in Action. And we're going to be talking about the basics of blockchain, how it's going to change many of the things that we do, and a lot of the security attributes related to blockchain. So hi, Bina. How are you? Good. I'm doing very good, Mark. How are you? Pretty good. Um, I'm on the West Coast. Are you Are you in Buffalo? Yeah, I'm in Buffalo, New York. How are and things out there? Cold? It's cold, but it's very calm and nice and a beautiful a layer of snow. And uh, it's wow. nice, very nice. You, I, yeah. you should work for the uh, the Buffalo Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> we love snow here in Buffalo. You must. I mean, because my, my image of, of Buffalo is I, I was a big football fan growing up, um, you know, when I was young. And Buffalo was always playing in the snow, you know, poor O.J. Simpson was out there running on ice, you know, <laughs> and uh, it yeah. was, uh, that's the, that image that's forever etched in my mind, but, uh, but apparently it's, it's quite nice, huh? Yeah, it's really nice. We, we love winters, you know, it's calm and it doesn't make a noise when the snow falls, so <laughs> right. you wake Very up calm, and peaceful. wake up to a good surprise and, and, and it's, it's really nice, you know, if you like it, um, snow is beautiful. <laughs> yes, and um, and your football team is doing well this year as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've been following the football team forever, ever since I've been here. So we are hoping that they will make it to the Super Bowl one more time. Fingers, fingers crossed. Well, yeah. we didn't um, set this podcast to talk about Buffalo or uh, the Bills, but we start. We want to talk about another thing that starts with the B. Uh, we want to yes. talk about blockchain. And you've yeah. actually written a book called uh, Blockchain in Action. Yes, absolutely. So. Mm-hmm. Why would you write a book? Okay, so let me let me give you a, um, a history of how I started with, and then you'll understand why I wrote the book. Sure. In twenty in 2016, somebody mentioned there's a new technology coming about, which is going to revolutionize things. And um, so I was looking for books online. I was looking for papers online. I was looking for blogs online to look at what this is about. I didn't find anything. You know, so I didn't find anything that told me what it is. You know, so then I said, OK, let me tell the world what it is as I'm learning. Okay. You know, so so I, I started, that's actually a, yeah. a really good way to learn is to yeah. to rewrite exactly. your thoughts and share yeah. it. Right. Because it makes yeah. you kind of formalize and create some structure around it. Right. Yeah. And, and to your audience, I want to say that it took me some time. It's not like one day I said, yeah, I understand everything. Even though my background is in engineering and things like that, it took me about six months to get to that aha moment. Yes, I understand. You know. And then I, I said, OK, how do I tell people about it? And it takes a long time to put together a course, getting approval and things like that. So I said, What's a quick way to reach to reach the world, you know? And then I said Coursera, online learning. <laughs> so I I put together in the next year, you know, I put together four courses. Of, wow, that's uh, great! You know, introduction, how to program, how to develop application, and then what's out there, you know, looking out to the future. And I are, said, are, okay. are those courses still available on on, on Coursera? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Going, well, I, I will get the information afterwards, and I'm going to put it uh, put a link to them in the yeah. uh, the description of, of the the video and the podcast. Yeah. And so uh, when I when I when I did that I said okay it will be there for a couple of uh, couple of years. But it's still going strong. Excellent. And I have about two about 200,000 people enrolled in it and about you know 3 3,000 people a month enrolling in it. It's going strong. But then you know I said uh, we want something concrete for people who want to make a career out of this blockchain technology and the book is about um, how to develop applications people talk about this use case that use case but you know they don't tell you how to get there and so I said we should write a book it's more like a cookbook or a recipe book as to how to make applications for the blockchain so that you know you can solve problems that um, that will be useful for the world and that's it that's the reason I wrote the book the book is about um, how to solve problems on blockchain? 
how to develop applications and blockchain. And so that any student or any freelancer or anybody who wants to do this can um, self-learn from this book. That's you excellent. Know, and, 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 I, and I think especially f back a few years ago when you first started, you know, dipping your toes into the blockchain pool, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of kind of misperceptions that Bitcoin is blockchain and blockchain yes. is, is Bitcoin and, and, they, and they both start with B and Buffalo yeah. and Bina. It's all B. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but maybe you can, um, before we dive into like how you can use for applications, can you just quickly for, I, I think at this point most people understand, but, but the, you know, could you quickly help us to understand the differences between the two? Yeah, I, I would say, that, um, so let me again go back to the history of how it came about. Sure. You know, when I know some of us uh, will recall in 2008, the financial markets were crum crumbling down. I remember. You know? <laughs> yeah. Scarred for life. <laughs> you know, a lot of people lost jobs and things like that. And they, there was a, they said everything is going to go down the tube. And at that point, you know, the, all these centralized organizations we trusted, trust is the key word, were crumbling down. Ah. They did something wrong. And so... Um, some and somebody secretive person said, okay, we can do it without the centralized organization. And um, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin was released in 2008, 2009, actually, 2009, January. So um, everybody was excited. There was a m digital money that can be done peer to peer, you right. to me, without a central organization. But then when they looked, Closely at this technology, they found that the underlying trust layer, mm -hmm. that is the key word, the key phrase, the trust layer called the blockchain is much more potent, much more valuable to the, you know, the technology community. And that's the realization that made it, this is more than cryptocurrency. This is a trust layer. The blockchain that enabled Bitcoin. Right. The blockchain is a trust layer. If there's one one phrase that you want to learn, it's a trust layer. And let me position trust layer. Internet came about, a security layer came about, and that gave rise to online shopping and other things. Right? right. And now, when you establish a trust layer on top of it, you can do a lot more. You and I can trust each other and do transactions. Do you see what I mean? Sure. So uh, that is... So it's going to enable some more, uh, some other applications, which we haven't heard of. So what, well, basically what you're saying is, I mean, Bitcoin is obviously, it's a cryptocurrency. Um, it is one application of blockchain. Yes. It's, yeah. it's, a ma it's, and it's, dis it's a major disruptor. And you see players like PayPal and Square that are taking very, very heavy positions in block uh, into Bitcoin and using it as a, or enabling their customers to use it as a, um, a currency for transactions, right? Yeah, this is yeah. a huge development in the last few months, uh, partially probably also helping to fuel the, the, the rise of, 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 yeah. of, of Bitcoin price. But the underlying application there or platform is that trust layer. And so what, what other, before, I, I do want to take a step back and kind of go through some of the chapters of your book, but what other areas are ripe for dis, uh, disruption using this trust layer? Can you, maybe a couple examples. Yeah, I can give you one. One okay. is a micropayment. Um, yes. Let's consider, you know, I look up plastic cleanup all over the world. I'll give you something more business oriented too. This is, think about the plastic all over the world. This is a global problem. Sure. Okay. You and I cannot go to uh, Zambia or Mombasa, Kenya and clean up the plastic. Nope. Okay. So local people have to clean up. How do you incentivize the local people okay, all over the world to clean up the plastic? Okay, by paying micropayment, little, little payments. You know, the micropayments enough for them to incentivize to clean up the plastic. But at the same time, they may not have a bank account. They may not be interested in setting up a centralized bank account. And so this is that's one of the things i cover in i have an application that completely solves that <laughs> so is is that actually happening right now is there an organization out there that's doing this it may be doing it but not on a blockchain or something like mm. that but it's you know they're doing it but we, there's no accountability and sure. things like that sure. and blockchain can provide a mechanism for doing this formally automatically you know uh, so that it, if, if united nation establishes that and says okay Everybody, whoever who cleans up the plastic can get some small piece of money that sure. may be so small that 
it may not be significant for you and me um you know even for go through the bank account yeah i mean it's I mean? it's not it's not it's not going to justify the the 50 yeah. dollar wire fee that uh, our yeah. bank is going to charge us to pay this little micro payment that you right yeah so, so but then it's significant for a school girl that's what i say in mombasa kenya this may be uh, enough for her to go to a party this weekend you know do right. you see what i mean and so um and then she may decide i don't want to do it anymore that's it end of story mm-hmm. do you see what I mean? people can join the network and leave the network as they wish your record is not there you see you are not bound to it sure yeah. okay so let's back up a little bit and 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 go through your book and by the way i mean uh, the fact that you said it took you about 6 months of research uh to get a kind of a, a firm understanding um it says something about the both the complexity but also the 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 lack of solid information back when you got started yes. because you yes. do have a phd in electrical engineering you right i mean yes. you, so yes, you're you're already um, much farther down the road than ever most of us will ever get so um, you you do start off with some uh, in your book about some blockchain basics um, mm-hmm. and and <clears throat> maybe you can t- give us the basics and you kind of gave one example of an application but maybe you can talk about some applications that are actually being used right now but let, let's go back to the basics. Okay. The way, um, going back to it, it's a trust layer. Okay. You know? uh, so tell me that trust is not needed between you and you and relatives and friends and, you know, the company board or anywhere. You know, trust is an essential element. That's something that we have to understand. You know, in politics, in in experiments that we conduct, in the lab experiment, the COVID data that we record. Sure. <laughs> You know, we got to so, trust it. <laughs> trust it. So but but how, how does we, it how does it mechanically uh, actually work then? Yeah. How does it create the trust? Okay. You know, you might have heard of algorithmic trading, right? In financial mm-hmm. market, that is making millions of dollars or zillions of dollars for the or world. collapsing the financial s- yeah. s- system. <laughs> <laughs> the same way, it is. How do you trust? You verify. Mark is mark. Right. Nice, yeah, verify, and then you validate validate that you know this is the time or something like that verification validation and then we also record if i lend you ten thousand dollars you know i say okay it is it is is a valid person verified that he's a real human being Mm -hmm. and then i make a note of it Mm -hmm. right i make a note of it you make a note of it and also you tell your friend i tell my friend i lent mark ten thousand dollars so verification algorithmic verification algorithmic validation algorithmic record in with the contents of you, me, and two more people or n more people. That's it. And that will be a permanent part of that blockchain. It's a permanent blockchain. record, right? So you can think about the blockchain. Oh, yeah, Bina lent Mark $10,000. So that is recorded there. And before that is recorded, we all, we four of us or 10 of us or 10,000 of us agree, depending on the magnitude of the problem, you know, agree that that's a consensus, algorithmic mm-hmm. consensus, that this is indeed a fact, this is indeed a truth, and it goes up, and then it goes on the blockchain. And, and, and that's something I could never get my mind around because you do have to have that um, agreement, right? And how mm-hmm. does that process take place? Okay, so the agreement could be, you know, um, and, and there are so many ways. It started off with what is called the proof of work right. uh, in Bitcoin. Um, that that is very very um, energy uh, you know it consumes a lot of energy sure. in the proof of work because it is a, a difficult problem to solve but easy problem to uh, understand yes I agree that to verify the, the solution right verify yeah. Yeah, okay verify yeah it's easy to verify but difficult to solve and so uh, in the process of it's a brute force they are solving 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 trying to solve trying to solve they're consuming a lot of uh, work right. energy. And so that's why it's called proof of work. Now, th- that is the consensus process. And so, so many people try and then, but it could be, it doesn't have to be proof of work. It could be some other consensus algorithm where, you know, like I said, you know, if it is, we all agree that we, we see physically that I lent you $10,000, that that could be a consensus. Mm-hmm. So, and, or if I say, if I am a person, um, you know, a stakeholder, I have a lot of money in the Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency. If I say, I agree that this is a good good one, you know, yeah, we come to a consensus because I have a lot of stake. If yes, I sir. say, if I told a uh, lie, then I, I am standing to lose that money. Do you see what I mean? Sure, sure. So that is called proof of stake. Okay. And there are so many 
so, so there are proof of work is quite algorithmically intensive proof of stake is a little bit more um, you know reasonable and so there are so many consensus algorithm um, common sense consensus algorithms are coming about now so um, you can you can codify any of the common consensus algorithms that we have you know do you see sure. in, in real life you know all you have to do is how do we agree on something just put a code on that you know so um, that is um, that is what is the consensus process and the consensus process is needed for um, needed as a condition for recording so okay. we don't want we don't want lies on the blockchain right yeah so that's why you have a gatekeeper of verification gatekeeper of validation and a gatekeeper of consensus before it can be recorded on the blockchain and these gatekeepers are these are parts of the code or these yes. are okay okay these are parts of the verification and validation i would say is a part of the smart contract you might right. have heard of smart contract yeah and that yeah, i want to talk to that about that next so go, go ahead <laughs> Sorry. so yeah that's leading us to the smart contract yeah, yeah. the smart contract does the verif verification and the validation and the consensus is going to the protocol you know the blo blockchain code is a smart contract that does the verification and validation and the protocol is pushed to the lower level of protocol because we want some more some more strength in the consensus. We don't want any um, any simple method, not simple method, I would say you want a strong consensus algorithm, um, you know, that is uniform for everybody who's on the network. Like, you know, we don't want a consensus, one for your team and one for my team, right? right. Uh, everybody on the, everybody on, on the blockchain should be bound by the same consensus rule. It's like playing football, like, right. you know, we don't want the rules for you different than me. Do you see what I mean? So that's why the consensus algorithm should be the same for everybody on a given block, blockchain. Mm -hmm. So can you give um, a common use example of a smart contract? I'm talking about something that's out in the public domain and being used right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, for example, the one I do is... Um, um, a blind auction, you know. Okay. okay. So a blind auction example I do in the book. I have a. We, I played it with my students too. Okay. So uh, the first thing is um, in the smart contract. You understand the smart contract is a very very thin layer. It's not like a, you know. Um, that's the beauty of it. It's it's not a hundred thousands and thousands and lines of code. It just does the verification. Most of the, where a lot of computation is done outside in the existing systems. Nobody is going to go away. Right. You know, when we introduce security, we didn't vanquish the other system. We right. simply slid the security in. HTTP, HTTPS. All right. We don't even know when it came about. Right. right. So likewise, the trust layer is going to be there as a thin sliver of, um, you know, covertly uh, observing what's going on. And so the smart card, going back to it. You want only the people who are registered to be bidding, let's say. Right. That could be just like a um, verified traveler only goes into the air, airport. Okay. The same way um, blind auction could be ver registering people. You know, only the registered people could be um, bidding. Okay. Okay. And then validation, usually verification is a general rule, a general rule. You know, like anybody, anybody with a valid ticket uh, with a... You know, uh, or a DMV license can get into the airport, but they may be going to a specific, um, you know, a flight. The same way in the blind auction, going back to the blind auction, registered users only can bid. Second thing is that when they bid, they cannot be bidding um, below a certain level. Right. That's validation. Like okay. for example, if you have put a Picasso there, you know, you don't want to be. Um, <laughs> You don't want to bid them one dollar or two dollars. You, you want to set a base bid. Sure. You know, so, so ten million dollars. You cannot bid. You know, uh, ten million dollars or you know more. I mean, you just create a range that's 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 yeah. appropriate for that specific blind auction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is validation. <clears throat> okay. And then you go about, and then you there are also there's something called events. You cannot be it cannot be going on forever. We set the day. It's one day within the day. You have to do it. Okay. Um, and so that those are the um, code, those are the things that are codified in a smart contract. Going back to it, a smart contract codifies rules, policies, 
those are the things that are codified. It's not the, the major computations of calculating pi or something right, like right, that. Right, right, right. I mean. So if you have digital democracy, that's another example I do. You have to make sure that they are, it's a valid voter, right? Mm -hmm. And they vote within a certain period and things like that. So those, a smart contract codifies rules, policies, for governance, provenance, regulations, and so on. Excellent. So, so let me ask you, um, because this is very topical and timely in the U.S. right now, how can blockchain mm -hmm. and, and maybe smart contracts as well, because this is a, you know, a part of blockchain, but how can it be used to make the election process uh run more smoothly and more verifiably? Yeah. I mean, because that's a big issue right now. I mean, you know, you have a lot of uh, distrust uh, in terms of the results. And what yeah. can, how can blockchain be used to demonstrate these are the results and you can yeah. trust it? Okay. So um, we assume that they are registered voters. They vote at a certain place. Right now, judges oaths like let's take i mean maybe pennsylvania pennsylvania's oaths are kept in pennsylvania one place that precinct right. right if you had a blockchain as they are electronically voting there okay there'll be a copy in pennsylvania state there'll be a copy in the election office there'll be a copy in federal government Mm -hmm. Those are the nodes, blockchain nodes. Gotcha. So, so even if they change something in Pennsylvania. You would have a record of it in the blockchain, right? Yeah, in the yeah. blockchain, yeah. somewhere else. You know, that is the beauty of it. So if you could create a blockchain for democracy, you will know exactly who the voters are, how they voted. Even if somebody changes, you know, they cannot change. If they change it, you know, you're invalidated. Do you see what right. I mean? Right, right. So you have exact copy of it automatically created. Once it is confirmed, you and I and every stakeholder, not every, you don't have to have everybody. You can have nodes set up for you, me, and the, you know, state, say, state election board, federal election board, Supreme Court. I mean, I'm just making right, 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 right. You no, know, they could do it. You know, one thing I learned this time. You know, I've been voting for a long time. Is about the electoral college. I never even cared about it. <laughs> you know, the founding fathers did six, co several copies, and now they're making six copies. Six copies of? Of the, ele the electoral vote from every state. There are six copies. Redundancy, right? Right. Think about it. One copy is going to vice, I mean, the president of the Senate. Two copies going to archives. One copy is going to the state um, Secretary of State. One copy is going... So you see the redundancy there, redundancy for the sake of safety, privacy, and security of this document. Sure. So that's exactly the thing, but that's all paper, but now codify it in the blockchain. Sure. Okay. So, every, I mean, theoretically, you and I can ho host a node and we can get a copy. Of course, we don't want that happening. We cannot do anything about it, but, you know, what I'm saying is that Democratic Party can have a node. Sure. Republican Party can have a node. So they don't have to be waiting for three days, four days, five days, six days, six weeks for this. And they can instantly know this is what it is. Yeah. And and I, I guess that's a whole other discussion because then, you, you know, do you have, do you still have some kind of a paper ballot or you could, could you generate a paper ballot? Could, could voters go online and check to make sure that their vote was recorded accurately you know i mean i think if you have a way that me as an individual voter can somehow verify that yeah. you know and, and that's all part of that 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 chain that yes, blockchain absolutely. right and and once you can go in and it's like okay if you guys don't trust the results log into your portal or account and and, and just confirm it right you know yeah. yeah see um we didn't discuss something at the beginning of all these democratic process you and i will have a decentralized entity identity on that blockchain unique right. one mm -hmm. you know so 
Um, that is the one that's going to tell. Get me the record transaction where Mark voted. It is going to get you that. Right. Okay. So um, your identity. And you know that identity is not given by Facebook, LinkedIn, or your university or your company. It's self-generated. Wow. Okay. And self it, it theoretically, it can be self-generated. And then you say, that's my identity. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are things that come with it because, you, you, uh, you know, you, how many times in my class people say, oh, my God, I lost the identity. You know, well, but, did you, you heard about the, the gentleman with, in the UK that lost the hard drive with yeah, yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin <laughs> on it. And they're, they're going to yeah. tear up the dump looking for it. <laughs> they offered him $70 million, the, 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 the government, for the rights to go in and dig through the garbage. <laughs> so that is a problem, right? That's a problem, but I feel that with education, we can mm. take care of this. Yeah. You know, rem- recall the day when credit cards came about. We didn't know how to use the credit cards. Right. You know, now we're kind of a little bit savvy about it and things are better. I've, I think this is like a mass education. Everybody, you and I can generate an identity, but you cannot go back and say, I forgot my username. I forgot my password. That's not possible in that world, at least un- unless you go through a third party and things like that. If you want to purely work on the blockchain, I, I do it. In fact, I have identity for my class. I have identity. You can generate as many identities as you want. You know, you can generate one for the podcast, one for your business, one for your personal account. You know, it's a 256-bit number, sure. right? Every grain of sand can have an identity <laughs> and still it will be unique, you know. So that, that's what the beauty of that is. Uh, and these are things uh, people have to know. Yeah. You, you see what no, I mean? It's a process. It's not, yeah, it's a process. It's not just you and me or, uh, you know, people with PhDs and things like that. This is a technology for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, today, I, I prove that to my class. Today, you can create an identity, go on on the main, main with just a browser enabled, you can go on and transact. If you're linked, I, I've done that. It's I've done amazing. That because, uh, yeah. I've done that because just to make sure that I, I know what I'm talking about. I've done that with. <laughs> no, I, I, I did it too. I, I um, started ex- exploring Bitcoin in uh, maybe 2016, and and I, I wrote a couple of blog posts about it. But before I wrote anything, I went online and actually did some transactions. Yeah. I wanted to see because if it was just this, uh, you know, the, the bubble like the the Dutch tulip story right you know which is a common example of of, of a kind of a crazy bubble right on, on based upon tulip bulbs uh but if it was like one of those i wanted to see can the cryptocurrency actually be used to transact business and yeah you know and at that time i was in japan actually in J- the, the the japanese government had announced that by the year 220 uh, 2020 that there would be something like 300,000 atms across japan that would be able to transact in Bitcoin. I don't know if they achieved that, but when you prove the transaction capability and then you see that commitment towards enabling it, I was like, you know, this is not going to go away. This is not a, a, a fad or, or a, 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 you know, a, a tulip bulb bubble or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I can, I can yeah, vouch for that. Yes. You know, I'm glad that I did that in 26, 20, I don't know when I did that. You can see the price increase now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's had some ups and downs, but you know that's that's to be accepted, or expected. Any kind of new disruptive technology, and um, and it kind of thrives on. I think it thrives on some of the some of the instability, uh, pe- because people are are looking for something that's verifiable, something that they can trust. You know, and people don't want to walk around with a pound of gold in their pocket. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I think it, it is very, very interesting um, as a trust layer. So I would say it is not something um, which is, uh, you know, at the periphery of technology. This is a mainstream. It's, sure. It is going to be a mainstream. So if you say in a layer of trust, it's going to disappear, you know, into the fabric of how we do, you know. But what is important is that the applications that are coming out, you're asking me, I don't even know what right. what else is going to come because I, I imagine there's one more thing that I can tell you that's in my book, I think the 10th, 11th, 10th chapter, I think. Yeah, maybe 10. It's about assets, digital assets. Okay. You and I can own a Picasso. 
<laughs> Maybe you could. <laughs> I could no, own no, a small no, micro piece of a no, Picasso. <laughs> micro, that's what it is. Micro piece of it. Okay. You see what I mean? So if you make it a digital asset, you know, I'm not saying digitizing it. You know, you say there's a Picasso and who owns it? Nobody's there to buy this Picasso. You know, maybe make a digital asset out of it. A tokenization, it's called tokenization of digital assets. You know, I own a piece, you own a piece. The ownership of who owns it. Actually, gosh, I mean, what a great investment model. Mm -hmm. Um, You know what? I would love, you know, there's an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that in the future, his paintings are going to be worth exponentially more than they are today. Exactly. I can't afford to do it. I can get a consortium of friends and, 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 and people I don't even know, as long as you've yes. got this blockchain identity. And then we yes. say, let's go buy that piece of art yeah. and we can all participate in the ownership and the upside of it. Right. Yes. That is an awesome I, business model. I, I do that for real estate in my book in one of the applications, you know. So, I want to invest in Mumbai. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put in my $20 and, uh, or whatever Bitcoin and, or but, whatever. Yeah. Well, I say that you and I are co-owners of this art that you're talking about. Yeah. You can bequeath it to somebody because you can write on the uh, thing wow. that it is uh, something. And then as it rises and falls, you can see the price rise and fall of the identity. Right. Okay, do you see what I mean? And so and you can invest you in can virtually say, anything then yeah, going forward. And then you can say, um, your friends, go look it up. You see the ownership of this, you know, the 10 people who well, own it. And then it also makes, because one of the problems with art or investments like that is traditionally it's not a very liquid investment. Yes. You know, but because I, I've got to find somebody who's going to buy this entire painting, right? But when you're selling, you could sell your micro portion of it. Wow. Basically, it's a way to take any physical asset and, yes. or even in IP and, and create yeah. an investment asset out of it. And, and, let, yeah. allow, and you could open it up to the masses, not just to the yes. super rich. Yes, that's what it. And the digital, digital assets, digitization, tokenization, you know, um, yeah. it will grow in value. It will come down in value. You won't believe that will give a marketplace for all these artists who would who, who desire to enter, but it's so hard to, the threshold is so high, they cannot do much about it. You know, uh, a crowd can help them, you know, make a living out of it or something like that. Do you Absolutely. see what I mean? Absolutely. And then you have yeah. sites like pa- Patreon that, um, mm-hmm. you know, where you can have your idea and then people invest in it. But, but I mean, that's they're, they're typically smaller investments anyway. But you, you, what you're talking about uh, before mm-hmm. is, you can go after any investment in the world. You know, mm-hmm. it could be a a, a, a tower yeah. in downtown Chicago. If as long as you have yeah. enough, inve- you know, uh, uh, in, enough people who that, that can go in, and um, yeah, that, I mean that's that's an amazing concept. I, I do it for the real estate because I know that in India, real estate is a very touchy subject. Yeah, do you see what I mean? Uh, and and also, I was in Peru, and what they said was. Most of the revolutions are caused by uh, real estate, you know, people yeah. just uh, taking away the real estate. And so I, real estate was my uh, digital token that I talk about. But it could be, that's a metaphor. Real yeah. estate is a metaphor. It could be sure. any digital asset. That's, and then the marketplace is another example. Marketplace is, you know, I, I mean, I can mention, I go to an online central provider and buy things from there. You know, it so happened once the central provider says your way of providing money for us, I'm not going to accept anymore. It's a PO, you know, purchase order. We sure. are not going to accept anymore. Then I looked up, what do I do? I have this much money and I have to get it for my student. Then I looked up, who's the seller? I directly contacted the seller. Mm-hmm. The seller was so happy. <laughs> we And I asked my PO, can we do PO with this person? And they agreed on the direct sales, yeah. direct yeah. marketplace. You know, we cut the middle person. That's number number one rule and instinct of every business in business yeah. person. Cut out the yeah. middle person. <laughs> and when you cut out the middle person, I'm not saying that we should do away with them. It is necessary for so many things. That, well, them they be there, but there are situations when you go directly, you're helping helping people on the ground. It may not, you you may be making more. You may be making more money for them. You may be getting more products when you cut out the middle person. Uh, uh, in some instances, for example, I, I can I, I can tell you, Monica Honey or something, go look it up. There are 
hundreds of them. I don't know which one is good, which one is better. Mm. But I heard that New Zealand is the one that makes it. Okay. You know, and nobody else, all the others are like, just, you know, fakes. Mm. You know, so what if we can go get, get honey? Uh, little things, little things like that. And then and this one I talk about is electronic components. I went to the direct person and, you know, it's such a big deal. Same thing with travel. Yeah. I bypassed local agencies because they couldn't give me a date of right. what, when we wanted to go. I, I directly went to this South American country. I didn't even know who they were. You know, I transacted with them directly and I got a, in a good, fantastic tour, you know. So, but that those are all things I make it up as a one person. But what if I can open it up through the blockchain sure. to the world? Sure. Okay. And those are the things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in your book, you mentioned something that I haven't heard before, and that's dApps. Yeah. See, dApps are, smart contracts are all right. You okay. know, they are a, a layer of code. But uh, many people don't know code. Okay. Right? So we have to provide them a good interface. So that, you know, uh, people forget, especially people in my academics, they all do all these codes, but they, they forget the upper layer where you have to expose this to the... Uh, the world so that you anybody can get into this. Uh, so dApps and decentralized applications are a layer over the smart contract that provide access to the smart contract and the blockchain services through the web. Okay, so it's a decentralized app or even maybe a digital app, but basically it's the interface that yeah. allows it me can, to go on and it gotcha. Can the, it okay. can be on the phone. People, yeah. people don't have laptops, but they have phones. They, yep. It can also be on the phone. In fact, uh, uh, I know people who have four phones and five phones. They don't have a house. They live under the tree. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, but they can access the smart contract in the blockchain through the DAP. Okay. That's, that DAP is something um, that shows up on the... Um, it's like a layer so that anybody can access the blockchain services and the smart contract. Excellent. Um, um, can you talk? I mean, because this, the, you know, the, the the theme of this show is to, or this podcast is typically um, related to security. Um, you you mentioned security and privacy. You may have already covered this, but you mentioned security and privacy in your book. Can you talk a little bit about how the blockchain can further enhance security and privacy? Yeah, um, it is built on security. Okay, it's a crypto. Uh, the strong foundation of blockchain it to survive the Bitcoin blockchain. 2009 now it is more than 10 years to survive because it has got a strong security fundamentals mm -hmm. okay and you can make it private by encrypting what you send basically there are also protocols which will make it so that you, you don't even know that you and i sent transactions okay it's, they're called shielded transactions i don't want to get too much into the thing so you can also make it private, secure. There are protocol that I a protocol by which you can make the transaction secure and private and transparent. But well, the secure and private and shielded part doesn't that make some governments uh, a little bit nervous? I mean, that's you know they, they one they're looking for <laughs> you know criminal behavior, but they're also looking for opportunities to tax right. And when yeah, you take yeah. transactions private. How does, uh, in, what's that going to lead to? Okay, so th those are the things come in regulations and mm -hmm. laws um, that, uh, you know, your financial services department is going to enact. You right. Know. Right now, in fact, I am in talk with, not just me, um, in New York is the forefront of financial services. Sure. Right now. The Department of Financial Services, we've got some, you know, we've, we've had several meetings. We have a memor memorandum of understanding with us to popular to publicize some of the things that they are doing and they are upfront with the rules and regulations so if there is something that is not right you know what do you do right how do you get that data uh, and something that is something that that comes to legal actions and uh, um, so they're setting up some type of uh, some regulatory yeah. framework and some guidelines yeah. best practices and say you know on the, on these kind of instances we would have to flag this transaction or you may yes. want to self flag etc yeah gotcha. yeah uh, on that you won't believe paypal facebook they're all involved in it in that particular 
Uh, yeah, I'm sure they they, yeah. they want to yeah. be part They're of that. They're all involved in it. Yeah. So they, they want their voice to be heard, you know, yeah. like how they will do it. And they are, uh, this is, um, I mean, I, I have, and right now, in fact, 22nd, I have to get involved in some, some things to do with that. So I'm, I'm not just me, there are a lot of people involved and I'm, I'm directly talking to some of the, um, and the people there, you know, about how it can be done and so on. So. Excellent. Um, let me ask you this, because I mean, we're, we're running out of time here, but um, in your in your book, you have a chapter called uh, Blockchain, the Road Ahead. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the issues with books is by the time it hits the market, some of the information needs to be, you kind of continually have to update it. So what is blockchain? Um, what's the what's the road ahead for blockchain? OK, um, the block, it's very bright. That's OK, I think I want to say, OK, it is it is. Enterprises, I can see on my LinkedIn who are all using it from Baidu to, you know, um, uh, VMware, everybody is involved in it, you know, so, um, so it's, it's, interest is very strong. Okay. Uh, Apart from that, I would say the trust enabling of the enterprise is going to happen. Okay. Okay. Everybody is going to reach out and say, yes, the truth that I have, you know, um, you know, I, the facts that I know is not going to be recorded in my thing so that I can change it. That has happened in so many cases, the COVID case, recording of cases, uh, the Detroit, uh, you know, the uh, lead level in people. Literally, they changed it. You know, that may not happen. So I think they know there are convincing use cases by which um, critical enterprises going ahead will introduce this trust layer. Okay. So that there is a record, not not for for governance, for provenance, for um, for proving that they have indeed done the right things. Sure. You know. So that is the next step. You know, and then there'll be applications, which you know I'm talking about. Local economies will benefit by it. Global economies will also benefit by it. You know, it's not just don't think about it as oh this has to be a big application. You know, it is equally applicable to local economies as it is applicable to global economies. You understand that trust is all the more important among, you know, uh, within the state than within the the whole federal government in in certain instances. So I think so. That's the next step. Future is is it is going to be a part of it. And I would say five years from now, we won't even be talking about, you know, this layer. It, It is going to be a part of the Internet. And because trust is installed, instilled, you know, you can do a lot more. You know, for example, autonomous cars can benefit by it. You know, how they make the decision, mm-hmm. how the data data is recorded in COVID situation, you know, in databases about, you know, there is, I have in the first chapter, I talk about five or six um, examples. I didn't put the link there because uh, they didn't want links from the first chapter. It's about sharing of information like in 9-11, you know, which was missed, there's sure. a gap. Sure. Okay, that could, if there was a node in Minnesota and there was a node in FBI, mm-hmm. and they even flagged and saying, oh, there's a problem. Or, you know, that could have been done. Texas mass shooting, I'm talking about that. It's not that I'm, I'm talking about gun control or anything like totally. that, but if the database was, was the node database was on, not the database, the the little bit of information was on the blockchain, not the database. The, the blockchain is not a database, but that little information was there. That person would have been sold the gun. Right, right. Yeah. Makes Things sense. like that, sharing of information. So I would say that a lot of application is going to come um, ahead. And also it's looking forward. You know, we are in 64-bit machine. This is giving you know, enormous power, you know, of uh, uh, decentralized identity. So far, it's been a centralized world. Where are we going next? Where? You know, where is the evolution? Where? Yeah. You know, yeah. So that's, I think that's what I feel. I, I've written some application in the first chapter as well as it's going to be a part of all of all of our systems. Yeah. Well, and, um, for for people who want to learn more and kind of keep abreast of events or developments in blockchain, mm-hmm. in addition to reading your book, Blockchain in Action, what would you recommend them? What 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 resources do you use or do you follow? Um, I see. Okay, I, I, at this time I have to tell you the the preferred blockchain for me is Ethereum. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are white. If you want technical knowledge, you can go to white paper. 
on all these things if it is technical knowledge. But I don't want to push people into learning technical knowledge. They have to be just like web savvy, internet savvy. They have to be blockchain savvy going forward. Not not programming or developing application, but to be able to interact. Sure. You know. So you have some etiquettes, email etiquettes. You know, etiquettes are all right, but more than that, you have to be educated about what's the best practices, what's not good to do. You know, you cannot give the secret words to people. Right. You know, if they ask you, you cannot give your SSN to people. Likewise, um, I, my my goal in doing things is that be educated about it. So I would say um, they can look at the technical knowledge. They can look at the white papers, and I do talk about. In, you know, they can look at Coursera courses right, on right. blockchain. They they can look at the courses. And my first chapter, I don't look at any. I don't show any you know, code. You know, I am. I'm just saying these are the use cases. Right. Convincing use cases in the last chapter, and I would say in the book, just read the problem statements. I have six DAFs. Just read the problems and don't go into the code unless you are a developer. You know, for for everyone, just read the problem statement. That will make you digital democracy, blind auction, tokenization, digital credentialing. What are you doing with education? People mm -hmm. get skills on the road, skills on the, you know, working things. You know, they don't have to come to university, central university anymore. Right. How do you take care of oh, That's my 11th chapter. So I have six dabs. You just read the problem statement. You will, you can imagine going forward what blockchain can do. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. I'm inspired and I'm going to probably uh, write those problem statements out and just, just look at them <laughs> like once a week just to kind of get the wheels going and, uh, and yeah. make you think. Because, I mean, the world's changing so so quickly and um, and sometimes it's a little scary, but a lot of times it's it's just really amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I still, I mean, our kids, they look at this stuff and they're like, yeah, of course. But like, you know, when we were growing up, if somebody said that this was possible, everything that you can do on this phone, I would be like, liar, no way. <laughs> I know. And, you and remember block... carrying this whole big bag of phone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, there, yeah, this is crazy. So, and and I and I, it's my opinion, and I, I think you're probably on board with this. That um, what's happening now with crypto and, and blockchain has the potential to, you know, be as impactful as the internet and as yeah. these things and and so on. So. Hey, Bina, it's, it's been really great talking with you. Um, highly recommend your book. And I will put links to both your book. I think we're going to put some coupon codes in the description as well for a discount on your, on your, on your, your book from Manning Publications, which again is Blockchain in Action. Mm -hmm. And I will find the links to your Coursera websites, yeah. or if you can email them to me, that'd be great. Yeah, I will do that. I will do that. And, yeah. um, and then we'll get that, get that out there. And I would love to touch base with you maybe, you know, a few months down the road, maybe six months down the road to see, because between now and then there could be some, um, some big, big changes, big right? Big news. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> it's, happen it's happening now. You know? Right. Well, we've got the yeah, inauguration, the presidential inauguration uh, that's supposed to be happening right now. <laughs> no, no. What I'm saying is that it was dormant for some time. Yeah. Now everything is coming up. And yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. So um, you can send me mail anytime. Okay, it's great talking to you, and uh, you take Very care. Nice. Okay. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Join our hosts as they discuss a wide range of topics and speak with leading cybersecurity, technology, and compliance experts. Now is the time for Secure Talk.